We the North, part two, we're doing the background. We need to set the background before we start building. We did the intro last week. We're going to do the background. I am saying that the North has been put into the shadow of Judah, and that should never be the case. I'm saying that it's actually an insult to the North. And this is why I say that. I'm going to demonstrate that today. We know that the history of Israel was written by Judahite authors in Jerusalem, the hub of the Davidic dynasty. When I make this statement, I am not saying that Judah wrote the text. I am saying that the text came from the Southern Kingdom. The specific author, the quest for authorship is not a thing in the ancient Near East. I repeat that. Who wrote what? Let's say, John Doe wrote this, was not a thing in the ancient Near East. You don't get that thought. You don't get the quest for who wrote this till the Greeks come on the stage. That is why when we go to um, Mesopotamia, the Epic of Gilgamesh doesn't have an author. Who wrote it? Doesn't matter. What the text says is what mattered to them. So my statement here is that the Southern Kingdom, they penned what we have today. The specific person who wrote it, I care less. So I repeat again. The history of ancient Israel in the Hebrew Bible was written by Judahite authors in Jerusalem, which is the capital of the Southern Kingdom, which is the hub of the Davidic dynasty. As such, as we have seen, it transmits Judahite ideas. And these ideas regard territory, kingship, temple, cult, territory, this is what we get. I would prove my case step by step. So because it comes from the South, it transmits the Southern ideas regarding called temple kingship territory. However, in the first half of the eighth century BCE, Israel ruled over the lion's share of the territory of the two Hebrew kingdoms. And the northern population accounted for three quarters of the people of Israel and Judah combined. Israel was stronger than Judah, both militarily and economically. And in the first half of the ninth century and in the first half of the eighth century, almost half the time the two kingdoms coexisted, Israel dominated the southern kingdom. Nonetheless, the northern kingdom, Israel, has lingered in the shadow of Judah, both in the story told in the Hebrew Bible and the attention paid to it by modern scholarship. 
what the scholars did was they took what the biblical text wrote. Mr. J um, Mr. Jason mentioned this last week. They took what the biblical text wrote and they ran with it. So they go on the field to prove what the text says. Now that has changed. And we have to come back and check what the text actually says and be bold enough to call it out and say that is inaccurate. So did the North write anything? Did they not have its own text? Of course. The North would have had their own texts. And these texts could have been written as early as the first half of the 8th century BCE. In the capital Samaria or in the temple of Yahweh at Bethel. repeat it because it's important we're talking about writing the north had their text and these texts were written as early as the first half of the 8th century bce in samaria or the temple of bethel we do have evidence for composition of even literary texts in the culture of Israel in the first half of the 8th century. Meaning that we have writing about half a century or a century before we see writing in Judah. I'm comparing the two. So you see who should stand out. Again, we have evidence of composition of even literary texts in the culture of Israel. Notice I didn't say in the land of Israel, the north. In, the, in its culture, it's embedded in the culture. Have a century or even a century before we see writing in Judah. Telling you that Israel, the northern kingdom, was more developed in material culture, in economy, trade relations with their neighboring lands. They even had international roads. So what would these texts have been? Mr. Mark, that's when we have the Hebrew text. Answering your question. What would the written compositions be? We're going to talk about all these. Traditions that we see in the biblical text, which is Judah high dominated, such as the Jacob cycle in Genesis. I was going to make a statement here, but it will take me off. Let me focus. We'll come back to all these traditions in the north. No, no problem. So traditions such as the Jacob cycle in Genesis, the Exodus tradition, what we know or what we call in scholarship as the Book of Saviors, that is in Judges, positive traditions regarding King Saul in Samuel, the Elijah, Elisha prophetic stories in the book of Kings. And the two northern prophets, Hosea and Amos. They had these traditions. And these traditions could have reached Judah orally or in a written form. The north had this or these, and both these texts, or both written texts and oral traditions, 
we are arguing were probably brought to Judah by Israelite refugees after the fall of the north in 720 BCE. You see, you would read of scribes in the courts of David and Solomon. So you think that was when Judah was righted. Not at all. The archaeology does not support it. What then happened is that these northern traditions were incorporated into the Judahite canon because they supported the Judahite ideology or because of political needs. They had to absorb the significant Israelite population in the kingdom. So the original Israelite or Northern traditions were subjected to Judahite needs and ideology. As in the case of the book of Samuel, which was written after the Northern kingdom was vanquished by Assyria and its elite were deported. This is when the book of Samuel is written. So the book of Samuel incorporated negative traditions from the North about David, the founder of the dynasty of the South. But then they gave it a twist to clear David of all wrongdoings. So even here, when the South is given a little voice, the genuine original voice of the North is barely heard in the Hebrew Bible because a twist is put on the accusations of the founder of the Davidic dynasty. Even their kingdom and kings are viewed as illegitimate. You get to the book of Chronicles, which was written much later than the book of Kings. You put in the third century BCE which represents second temple theology. Mr. Jason has mentioned this in the past. It contains second temple theology and political ideology. You will notice in the book of Chronicles that the history of the North is nearly avoided altogether. Why is that? You pick up the text. And only Jeroboam the first and Ahab are given relatively large shares of text. But as you would expect, the tone of this text is negative. They say that Jeroboam the first was the founder of the Northern Kingdom and he's described as the original apostate the individual who sinned doomed the North from the outset. Let me read this scripture and I ask you if there are any questions. We come to 1 Kings 16 and there's a mention of a, a chap called Omri. He is mentioned six times. Count how many times he's mentioned in the narrative speaking about him. It is six times. Does anyone know why this is problematic? Why this, I would say, is a spit in the face of the Northern Kingdom? Rabbi? Mr. Jason? He is, he's single-handedly the most important king in Israel history. Like actual on the ground history. Yeah, 
Omri is the founder of the most celebrated dynasty of the north, the king by whose name Israel is known in Assyrian records. This guy. He gets six verses. We'll look at him extensively. Seven verses are given to Jeroboam the second. He ruled for approximately even more than 40 years and conquered vast territories. We'll look at him as well. Very little is told about the capital Samaria and quite little is known about the countryside towns and villages. The reason is because the people in the south right end haven't been to the north. It's because of their distance from Jerusalem. The author lacks direct knowledge of the landscape. Why do I say that? We have a site of the Israelite territory in Transjordan. That's, that, that territory is the same size as the territory of Judah. But only a few towns are mentioned in the biblical text. You would think maybe it's too big to mention, but... 50 towns and more are mentioned in the same Judah, the same size of this uh, Israelite territory in the Transjordan. It's not mentioned. The author doesn't know. He hasn't been that far. He lacks the information. So when I say is Judah dominated? You see where I'm coming from. I've got more coming. But before we go in to the archaeology, what has been dug, what we know, are there any questions, comments, contributions? This, I'm sorry, man. I'm going to be commenting. This is good. This is really good because you we, we get to see the scope of what the north really was man you hear of david or solomon ruling from down at the top all the way up to the down of the Bathsheba. We'll, we'll check that statement is that accurate i beg to differ awesome let's go on so there's been a lot of work done in the field of archaeology a lot of work jerusalem has been ducked over and over again. So when we look at Iron Age Judah, it has been thoroughly studied. Jerusalem is one of the most excavated cities, especially over the last 50 years. It's been one of the most excavated cities in the world. And almost all the major sites in its countryside has been excavated. Mizpah and Hebron in the highlands, Lahish and Beth Shemesh in the, what they call the Shephilah, Bathsheba and Arad in the Bathsheba Valley. It's all been excavated. The north has also been excavated. So Samaria, the capital, has been thoroughly excavated twice in the past. And all major country sites have also been um, explored thoroughly. Bethel, Shechem, and Tel El Farah in the hill country has been dug. Giza in the southwest, Do on the coast, Megiddo, Jezreel, Hazor, and Dan in the northern valleys. They have all been excavated. They've been meticulously investigated in archaeological surveys and have enabled the drawing of settlement maps by periods. This is what I'm talking about. 
we see different layers and they're dated. These places have been excavated. We have the evidence. So we can check what the text is saying. We don't have to be scared to find something different. That is being intellectually dishonest. What does the evidence on the ground tell us? So it is not only taking the Bible's word for it, it is field research that enables one to write an archaeologically based Judahite ideology free history of Israel. And now when we do a reconstruction, it's a balanced one. So we're going to use archaeology combined with the little that we know from the ancient Near Eastern texts. And then carefully with those biblical texts that can be judged to provide genuine, non-propagandistic information of the Northern Kingdom, even vague ones, we can use them. Questions before I move on. Uh, um, so back to this cat armory that I mean we know little or nothing about. That would be <laughs> so what okay. I mean, I've never heard a sermon preached in the Christian church about this cat named Armory, and I've been I was in there a hundred years. So I'm saying that would be like you knowing me my whole life, my whole work ethic, you know my what it is, how it what it is that I do, how I do it and you 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 write an assessment of me in six scriptures is this what you're saying happened here correct so this cannot be accurate it cannot be anything more than propaganda because I, I would have never even known who in the world is this guy correct not knowing all of his exploits and not all, knowing that he was you know and had four generations yeah four who would have known that you couldn't you can't glean that out of six verses. It, it would be like trying to write my life story in six verses. It's impossible. Yep. So this this was definitely a slight and, and, and a way to mishandle this guy and to put your foot on the neck. Rabbi, mm -hmm. Mr. Jason, do you have any recreations, uh, slides of what they say the North would have looked like? in Omri's time? We'll present all of it. Oh my God, yo. <laughs> they did the North dirty. Wait till you see this stuff. O-M-G. Broken. This, this is past dirty. This is, this is, I mean, dirty is a, you just cleaned it up with dirty. This has, this is the worst slight that they ever could have put on a person. This is thousand years worth of trickery. Really, you know what I'm saying? Because what happened is, you know, because there's no, because uh, because the normal person that reads the Bible wouldn't have all this archaeological information, wouldn't have the stuff. So you just read it and take it at face value. So Correct. you would automatically assume that Israel, the, all the bad stuff that happened to Israel because they, they left God or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You're not really looking at all the information. You know, but then when, like I said, we have uh, scholarly people that come and, and check everybody's story, and then you'd be like, well, what did I miss? How did I miss that? Because you wasn't looking at it. You didn't even know it existed, you know, the information. Exactly. Awesome. So what we're doing is I'm demonstrating where we should put Judah in the northern kingdom. Who comes first? Who is more prominent? Who should tell the story? Or who should have? We're looking at writing because a text was written which put the North in the shadows. How did the ability to even write to Judah? Awesome. Let's move on. 
Now, we come to the north. Let's look at the north. We see Hebrew inscriptions in the late 9th century, beginning of the 8th century. And we have two corpora that, that is plural for corpus. We have two corpora that gives us evidence of writing in the late 9th century, beginning of the 8th century BCE, in the north, what is called the Sumerian Ostraka. An Ostraka is a broken pot shed inscribed with ink. What does the Ostraka speak about? Well, it speaks about shipments of oil and wine from the countryside to the capital, Samaria. About 100 of them was found in the beginning of the 20th century. Harvard had an expedition to Samaria and this was discovered. You have these inscriptions from the late 9th century, beginning of the 8th century, where we have writing in the north. So there's two corpora, two corpuses, if I can say that. The Samarian Ostraka, and then the second one comes from the far south. So now when people hear far south, they think in Judah, not at all. This is Contilet Ajut. We looked at that last week or two weeks ago. This is where it's located. It's located in the northeastern part of the Sinai Peninsula. So far south does not mean Judah. It's far to the south is what is meant. It is located in one of the main roads which leads from the south of the desert to the coast. And this site is affiliated more with the north, that is Israel, than with Judah, although it is located in the south. When I say south, I don't mean Judah. So we see the ability of the north to compose literary text here at Contilet Ajud, where we have at least one inscription of literary nature. And when we, look, when we look at literary composition, there's another one. Let me land and then you come in, Mr. David. There's another one. So we have one here, and I'm not talking about just written text. I'm talking about literary compositions. The second one, um, which cannot exactly be described as Hebrew, but it comes from the territory of the Northern Kingdom. The Tel Deir Allah plaster, where we have Balaam the seer mentioned in our book of Numbers. This is literary inscriptions dating to the beginning of the 8th century. We're looking at Northern Israel, the North. We write in composition. Not just dates and inscriptions on, 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 on poetry and stuff. You write in a composition. Mr. David, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, like um, poems and essays and stuff like that. That's when you say literary examples, that's what you're talking about, right? Correct, yes. Uh, so in the north, we see that the 8th century is the time that we can already speak about the composition of biblical texts in the north. I repeat it. The traditions that the North had that were incorporated in the biblical text were written, that was included in the Judahite text, was written before the, the South started writing. They had their traditions. 
like I said, the Jacob cycle, the Exodus, um, what else? The the judges, some of the traditions in there, etc. They were not writing biblical texts, let me say. But their traditions were taken and put into the text that the Judahites wrote. But they were writing in the 8th century. The time that we can already speak about the composition of biblical texts. So you would notice, or this is evidence, that the northern kingdom was then so prosperous. They already had centralization of administration. The power of the royal court at this time. This was a time of Jeroboam II, the king who ruled Israel for over 40 years and conquered vast territories. That is why some of the earliest tradition in the biblical text seem to have originated in the territory of Israel rather than in Judah and around Jerusalem. Awesome. When we come to Judah, we see writing in Judah in the late 8th century, late 8th century, very late 8th century. And what you have is composition of administration text. You're not looking at literary compositions. You have dramatic dissemination of writing in Judah in the 7th century. This is when you have the composition of biblical text, including the Deuteronomistic history. That is the earliest version of which was um, put in writing, composed in Jerusalem in the late seventh century. Which tells you that writing in Judah was after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. Is important. They are writing in Judah after the fall of the north. So where is writing as a tool coming from into Judah? You did not hear the question. <laughs> Madam Pamela answered it in the chat. I also want to answer it vocally. I'll ask the question again. Writing as a tool, where is it coming from? Into Judah. <laughs> it came to Judah while the north was leaving. It came from the north. Came from the mm -hmm. north. So the knowledge of writing, advanced knowledge of administration, and early biblical composition, which were later incorporated into the Judahite dominated biblical text, was brought from the kingdom of Israel to Judah. 720 BCE. So this great moment in religious and literary history was only after the fall of the North. This was when Judah grew into a fully developed state with the necessary complement of professional priests and trained scribes able to undertake such a task. which I believe is the key to understand the passion and power of the Bible's greatest historical saga. It starts with a recognition of the unique time and place in which it was initially composed. The unique time and place. When was the time? When the North was noble. When the elite had been exiled. When you had an influx of the north 
refugees coming into the South, bringing their advanced culture. Let me summarize it that way. This is when Judah, or when Judah suddenly faced the non-Israelite world on its own, it needed a defining and motivating text. That text was the historical core of the Bible, composed in Jerusalem in the course of the 7th century BCE. It was the historical core of the biblical text composed in Jerusalem. And then you would notice something. Because Judah was the birthplace of ancient Israel's central scripture, it is, it is highly surprising that the biblical text repeatedly stresses Judah's special status from the beginning of Israel's history. How do we know that? It was in the ancient Judahite capital of Hebron, in the cave of Machpelah, that the revered, the cherished, admired patriarchs and matriarchs were buried. It was Judah among all the all of Jacob's sons, whose destiny was to rule over all the other tribes of Israel. We are told that at the time of the invasion of Canaan, only Judah was said to have fully eradicated the idolatrous Canaanite, their presence in their tribal inheritance. Meaning that Judahite's loyalty to the deity's commands was unmatched among the other Israelite warriors. It was from the rural Judahite village of Bethlehem that David, Israel's greatest king and military leader, emerged onto the stage of biblical history. And we know that. It's David's conquest of Jerusalem that represented the final act of the drama of the conquest of Canaan. But despite Judah's prominence in the Bible, there is no archaeological indication until the 8th century BCE that this small and rather isolated highland area, which was surrounded by barren steppe land on both east and south, possessed any particular importance. It was Israel, not Judah, that initiated wars in the region. It was Israel, not Judah, that conducted wide ranging diplomacy and trade. When the two kingdoms came into conflict, Judah was usually on the defensive. It was usually forced to call in neighboring powers to come to its aid. Until the late 8th century, there is no indication that Judah was anything more than a marginal factor in regional affairs. You say, Rabbi, I think that you're biased. Well, let me go to the scripture. Because in a very candid moment, the biblical historian quotes a fable to support my statement. Second Kings 14, we read, And Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, this is a fable, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, give your daughter to my son for a wife. 
What is there not telling the South in this fable? It's saying, like, yo, you weak. Why you, you like a little twig? I'm like a, I'm a giant over here. Why are you coming next to me? Correct. Because he's comparing the thistle and the cedar. Like, you know, we're close to me, bro. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Give my daughter to what? We only marry cedars over here, bro. No thistles. <laughs> that is what he's telling him. The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon. We're not equals. On the international scene, Judah seems to have been just a rather small an isolated kingdom. Now let's go outside the Bible. You think Rabbi is making this up. This is why the great conquering Assyrian king, Sargon II, mockingly states in his letter to God, Sanhedrin's San letter to God, on his campaign to Judah. This is what he says. Judah lies far away. He's mocking. Like, you? When you get a chance, read this. St. Hembrin's letter to God on his campaign to Judah. This is how he addresses them. So how come this great empire in the north is now in the shadow, is now the thistle and someone else the sitter? So what then changed? Beginning in the late 8th century BCE, something extraordinary happened. A series of earth-shattering changes, which begins with Israel's fall which suddenly altered the political and religious landscape. The refugees moved into Judah. Judah became big, like huge, 15 times huger than what it was. Judah's population swelled to unprecedented levels. Its capital city became a national religious center and an active metropolis for the first time. This is important. Because the north is not there and they're now a vassal of Assyria, now intensive trade began with surrounding nations. Now they can take part in the oil trade, the olive trade. Finally, a major religious reform focused on the exclusive worship of yud heh vav -He in, in the Jerusalem temple, started cultivating a revolutionary new understanding of the God of Israel. In an analysis of the historical and social developments of the 9th and 8th century BCE, in the Near East, explain some of these changes. You don't need to depend on the Bible. I can go outside it and look from that Syrian point of view. So they tell similar stories. We have extra biblical sources. And then the archaeology of late Monaic Judah offers even more important clues. That is when they start talking about a united monarchy. Repeat it again. That is when they started talking about a united monarchy. I've repeated a third time. That is when they started talking about a united monarchy. But there is no compelling archaeological evidence for the historical existence of a vast united monarchy centered in Jerusalem that encompassed the entire land of Israel. 
I know this is the most unsettling, uh, uh, unsettling, unsettling clash between archaeological finds and the Bible. If there was no exodus, as the Bible narrates it, no conquest, no united monarchy, what are we to make of the biblical desire for unification? What are we to make of the long and difficult relationship between the kingdoms of Judah and Israel for almost 200 years? The reality is this. There were always two distinct highland entities of which the south was always the poorer weaker more rural and less influential until it rose to sudden spectacular prominence after the fall of the northern kingdom of israel These are the facts on the ground. The kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah in the south, were always two distinct highland entities. There is no evidence of a united monarchy compelling evidence, let me put it that way, that one king ruled from Dan in the north all the way to Bathsheba. Not at all. These are the facts on the ground. And it would be interesting to see if anyone can provide any archaeological data, historical data that shows that Judah was ever prominent than the north. It's not there. So how does the thistle take the front stage and then the cedar of Lebanon in the shadows we will start by looking at Egypt's domination of the land of Canaan we will start by looking at the Amana letters we would look at how Israel came to be. We will look at the territory that Saul covered. And we're going to bring this lost empire and make noise about it.